to me and she talks to me about how she wants me to exercise and get healthy and ex- and lose weight. And I'm like, what kind of weird wormhole have I fallen into where this stripper is trying to get my shit together? <laughs> You know, go do another bump in the back, and we'll talk about our life choices. I'll tell you, this, this is how clueless I was about the bikini girl at uh, Cheetah's. That was wonderful. <laughs> That's so wonderful. I went, I went to Cheetah's to, in order to see Friends band play because they had like live bands at Cheetah's at least back then. I'm just like 2010, yeah. and so my friends were like, "Hey, come see us at Cheetah's." I didn't even know it was a bikini bar. I was just like, "Oh." Wow, okay, sort of a bonus. Because of Why are they keeping their clothes on? I still don't understand that concept. But um, but when I went for the lap dance, uh, and she's like trying to find something to gyrate against, I was like, the whole time I'm like uh, listening to my friends play. And, and it was like, it was impossible to focus because I was just like, wow, that's a really good, they're doing a great job with that song. And she kept, and it was funny, I kept looking over to see what they're doing in between her. And she kept like, one, it was like I think she actually literally grabbed my face and made me focus at one point. <laughs> and she's like, one another? I'm like, uh, well, now I'm going to go listen to them. <laughs> Because I realized I was, it wasn't happening. I was at a party one time at the Century Club. And, uh, some friends of mine were playing the party. Uh, a, a comic, uh, Blaine Capatch, and a, a couple oh, of yeah. other comics that he was in a band with called the Buxotics. And... Uh, uh, Rita Dalbert, who now runs Lucha Vavum, was the lead singer, and she's great. And uh, so they were playing this party, and I didn't realize at first that it was a, a, it was a premiere party for an adult film. And uh, and so there were women walking around, and there was one of them was walking around wearing a, just like a fishnet body stocking and nothing else. Mm. And it just was like she was sticking out all over and I was just like, aren't you afraid those are going to catch on something? (laughs) And, and, uh, it was just too much for me. I have to say, what was her uh, name? Flipper. Uh (laughs) Uh, Uh, I actually was doing a show at the improv this after I lost away. And I do the, when I hold the cigar and go bang, bang in my act. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Ginger Lynn, the porn star walked out of my show and my wife was in the hallway and she said to him, that guy's so sexist. He's demeaning to women. Ah. Ginger Lynn, the porn star. Yeah. No kidding. Right. Um, well, there's one thing that I wanted to make sure I addressed and asked and Andrew was cool enough to, um, uh, agree to do this. I, I ran this question by him beforehand because people might go, what the hell are you asking somebody about this for? Okay. So one thing I've always wondered um, and feel free to chime in as well on this, Bob. But um, one thing I've always wondered is, um, like, for me, I, I sort of had, like, a red line for myself that if I hit over... The reason, oh, I don't know why I did it. That if I went over 340, I was going to, like, do whatever to lose weight for a few pounds at least, even though I thought it was hopeless to really go for it. And um, and the reason why it just popped into my head was that there was... But the biggest friend I knew was a guy who weighed 344, and I remember it was when I was around 280 that uh, that I found his weight, and I thought, man, I don't ever want to turn out like him. And so then I get to 340, and it freaked me out, and I would lose like 10 pounds and get back down to the 330 or 320 range. Held that for like a decade, and sure enough, my friend died this year, uh, unfortunately, and due to weight stuff. And the thing was, um, I've always wondered, like, what is it about some people where it's like they don't stop at a certain point. But for me, it was also like if I could tell I was getting, for lack of a better term, big man boobs, I would try to stop myself and lose some weight. But like I've always wondered, like you know, does everybody have a red line in their head somewhere? You think, or do some people just not have a limit? I because think there's, there's, a, so- there's a lot going on there. There's a lot to unpack there. The first thing that's important to realize is that I think everybody has different genetics, mm-hmm. and for me. You know, it was what I was talking about earlier. There was always this compulsion to eat, to the this hormonal city for food, and I think that in the face of that, it was very hard to draw any red lines. But five twenty five was where I decided it had to stop. And then when the health issues came up, you know, I just I didn't want to die. Uh, so I think you know there was a lot of wake up there and. You know, again, it's it's a it's a it's being devices of your own decisions to some extent. And the uh, the other thing is, um, you just it's the boiling frog. You know that story. You just keep going. You know, I used to play this game when I was heavier. I called, "Am I fatter than that guy?" And 
There are no winners in Am I Fatter Than That Guy. And it just, you know, it's so weird for me sometimes not to be the fattest guy in the room. And, uh, it, it's, it, but for me, it was the, that sort of wake up of, oh, I'm in a hospital. They're going to open me up. I had a, you know, the first surgery I had was 11 hours. It, 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 it you do not, I got to leave a hospital 18 times. Mm. I got to leave a hospital 18 times, and that meant so much to me. I keep bracelets on my refrigerator to remind me. You know, I read an article recently about a guy in England who was 980 pounds, and he had become completely immobile. His life had, had, had shrunk to his bed where people from the National Health would come and wash him, and he would have delivery people bring him 20,000 calories of food a day. And to find a way to turn that around, he lost 700 pounds. Wow. He had to find something in himself, and I had to find something that made being alive more important than eating. And for me, it, you know, it took 35 years. I was, I, I think the other thing that was important to me, that is important, Bob touched on this a little bit. When I was 21, I lost 100 pounds on a liquid diet called Optifast. Hmm. I went from 305 to 200, and uh, I think it, I lost 105 pounds in 16 weeks. Hmm. And I think it permanently affected my metabolism. Hmm. Uh, I am very efficient with food. And I, I, you know, even at my heaviest, I would eat and I would eat a lot, but not, not like that. Do you know what I mean? So I think my metabolism was permanently screwed up from that fasting experience in my early 20s. And, and, and that was my pattern. I would gain a lot of weight and I would lose it over time, and, but I would never lose all of it. And then I would gain more. I was 300 five then 200 i was uh 360 then 260 i was uh 440 then 330 and then i was 525 mm. and you know realizing that that pattern is happening in your life and figuring out what's important to me what is important to me right now mm. and what is important to me right now is not dying that's what it took for me and realizing that that was the most important thing in my life made me understand that the trade-off of having the, the sleeve gastrectomy, the trade-off of giving up TV and all of those other things so that I have the time to spend on the hill, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. It's so worth it. Um, for me, I'm just seeing if this sparks something. This isn't really something to brag about because you'll wait till I hear the end of it. But the thing was, I what finally got me off my ass uh, was that um, uh, my one of my best friends for uh, the last five years. Uh, I'll leave her name out of it because I didn't ask her if it was cool to talk about the story. But basically, she's a gorgeous gal. Um, people that know anything about me know who, who will know who I'm talking about. But. Um, and anyways, uh, I really, you know, had a, quite the crush on her. No pun intended with the word crush on weight, but I had quite a crush on her. And basically uh, tried to, took her out for New Year's Eve uh, two years ago to a big event and thought, for various reasons, it seemed like things were headed in the right direction that, you know, that I would have a chance to kiss her at night and, uh, kiss her at midnight and make, you know, make it clear how I felt and all this. And, and she shot me down, but, but said, hey, you know, I'm concerned about you. It's a matter of, um, you know, were you, are you willing to lose uh, weight? Because I'm afraid I was in the hospital a lot. I had a side effect of a recurring leg infection tied to this stuff. And, uh, and she's like, you know, I can't be with somebody if I'm thinking they're going to be dead sometime in a year or two. And I was like, holy shit, you really think I'm going to be dead? And she goes, well, how many times do you have to go to the damn hospital to, you know, um, before you realize that people are scared? And, uh, and even then, she, she had offered to take me to a workout group that she goes to like 5.30 in the morning out in Culver City from this area and bring me back in time to, get, to make it to work three days a week and I was like I'm not getting up at 5.30 but it was finally a couple months later I was in the hospital again missed out on uh, seeing Bruce Springsteen I was holding on a bunch of tickets for friends got sick 
they had to come get the tickets and then they were all like god what else do you have to lose dude i mean to you know finally you realize you're ruining your life and uh and so i finally was like okay i'm gonna go to this class and see what happens and i wound up losing like started losing the weight for four months uh she took me out there like three days a week it was incredible and uh without that you know and eventually she had to stop doing it but i just switched and kept going here in the gym and she never went out with me i tried, i was like hey lost 60 pounds because so she had said try losing 60 and uh, then she's like well to be honest with you it was really i just couldn't think of anything else to make you lose the weight finally and by then i f- was feeling better and people were telling me such complimentary things that i thought oh screw it if i don't get her i'll just keep losing the weight anyway uh, but there's a lot going on there, and yeah. I, I think one of the things that's interesting is one of the things I've learned over the last f- few months and years is uh, I was always um, I did that. I f- yeah. fell in love with women who didn't love me back, mm-hmm. and uh, and I, part of it was I think of staying a, uh, keeping it virtual. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's just... It, it, you keep the weight on because you were afraid of dealing with a real relationship. I used to call it meat armor. Mm-hmm. That's and, what I was doing. And uh, it's just, yeah, you got to find a way. you just got to find a way. You're, yeah. you're basically saying to yourself that you're using the weight as an excuse for rejection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And once you lose the weight, you don't have that excuse anymore. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's the fear. Yeah, I had a woman once said to me, "If you lose a hundred pounds, I'll, you know, sleep uh-huh. with you." Yeah, and of course, I said, "If I lost a hundred pounds, I wouldn't want to sleep with you, baby." <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but I want to present to you guys. Oh my yeah, diet yeah, please. I want to ask about that. Yeah, it's called Better Health. It's uh, my own diet book, and every page says eat less and exercise more. <laughs> <laughs> every freaking page, so it's an easy read. Huh. Available at bobzetty dot com, and my new CD, Unplugged and Plugged Up, baby. <laughs> and I actually said in the liner notes that I'm probably one of the only comedians who gained weight to put out a CD. There you go. So it's right there. <laughs> and I'll uh, guess where you put it on the stack of other stuff over here. <laughs> I, I do have quite a uh, hoarding collection. I got no, It's organized though. Well, I, I just recently you wouldn't make hoarders. Organized. You'd make storage wars, but not hoarders. <laughs> yeah, well, it's an upgrade. Ask David, our, our, our trouble, our sound guy who had to put up with this place for years. I, I prefer sound engineer. Sound engineer. Because it's right. actually a little bit more technical. You're right. You're right. I'm Don't sorry. you agree with me, Andrew, on that? Since you're an IT guy, I, you know, you can call me whatever you want. Just pay the bill. I'm not talking about him. But, <laughs> Yeah. Um, anything that you guys want to spotlight upcoming shows? Uh, I know you've always got tons of stuff, Bob. But uh, let me hear from both of you guys. Bobzany.com for all your needs. All I have needs. it all listed there, depending okay. on where you're at. I might be headed your neck of the woods. I've been, I've performed in all 50 states and uh, nine countries. Also, I performed in Guam back in 1988. So... Nothing against North Korea, but I already yeah. bombed there. <laughs> um, before I ask you, Andrew, do my, I, I wanna, there's one thing I want to ask uh, uh, that I would have asked you if, uh, sooner, but we wound up talking about this topic the whole time. I wanted to see if you had like a, a favorite, like w- most awful stand-up gig of all time, Bob. Oh, well, do podcasts count? Oh. <laughs> wow. Okay. Which podcast? Oh, you're talking about that other one. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about my own podcast. Oh, all right. Yeah. I'm not talking about yours. Oh, all right. No, sure. Please don't read into that. <laughs> That's what we totally thought you were saying. I was like, damn. Oh, no, I would never do anything like that. That would be mean in my copy. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, do, do, do you have like a, like a worst gig ever story that uh, might be funny? I, I, uh, we all do. If you, uh, I've done it 40 years, so yeah. Yes, yeah. I do, but I don't try to focus all in right, on all this, right. you know? yeah. Okay, no problem. Um, I, I, I'll give you a story. My wife and I were performing in Maui uh-huh. at this bar, and there was this guy in a wheelchair, and it turned out to be actor Richard Denning, who was in The Creature of Black Lagoon. He was okay. also played the governor on the first Hawaii Five-O show. Mm. And she, he started heckling her, and he, she heckled him back, and he wheeled out on her. So, <laughs> wow. didn't walk out. He wheeled out. It was just a wonderful <laughs> moment. And I, Lovely. I didn't get his autograph. Uh, how about you, Andrew? Anything you want to plug? Or do you have a worse story before we head out to? Well, I got a couple things for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing two shows here in Los Angeles in the next few weeks that I think are worth coming to. Uh, my friend Robin Reiser is putting together a show called Historia. It's a storytelling show at Book Show in uh, Highland Park. And uh, that will be October 18th, Wednesday, October 18th at 7 p.m. And uh, I'm also 
on a show at three clubs uh, called Tales from Tinseltown, and I'm going to tell the story of how I was on.